Going live in... Hang, hang on, it's setting up. Live, I just got notified. Three, two, one, and we're live. Hello, everyone. Hey, hi. Hello, 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 and welcome back to We Three Queens. Before we get started with announcing our contestant winners, We Three Queens wants to take a moment to talk about an important topic. Today is the anniversary of Martin Luther King's speech in which he told Americans and the world of a dream in which our nation would rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. 57 years later, though the means by which the black community has been cut down have changed, the pernicious effects of racism endure. This week, Jacob Blake was shot in the back seven times in front of his children by a police officer in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He then spent the week handcuffed to his hospital bed and faces a lifetime of paralysis. Lack of justice for these murders of black people such as Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Elijah McCain are the terrible, are the terrible result of systemic racism plaguing our country. Police are not supposed to shoot people in the back. Police are not supposed to kill criminals. It is not enough to not be racist. Must be anti-racist. We must interrupt racism in our daily lives. We must fight against the institutions that perpetuate systemic racism. We Three Queens stands with the Black Lives Matter movement and we encourage others to stand with the movement as well. For resources on how to fight racism, check out the links in the comments. Thank you. It is now time for us, yay! The winners of the Ballroom and Y'all's Room Challenge. I'm so excited. All right, so the first category up is solitary refinement. <laughs> and the winner of that category is Nico Granados, AKA Sierra La Puerta. Oh, she served it that. Oof. Yes, ma'am, sir. Oh, yeah. that gown was everything. <laughs> All right. And for the category of Come at me, COVID. The winner is Melissa Gilpin Ball. Congratulations. She killed COVID with all that glitter on her. I was like, mm, yes, Oof. yes. Rainbows can perform miracles. And those eyes, man. Oh, that was good. And the winner of the category, make mine a <laughs> meme? Go on, good job, baby. And the winner is Trey Jolly. Woo. Serving Patrick uh, Star Realness. Miss. <laughs> he could kill someone in those heels. I'm inspired to be a Gary the Snail in fishnets. <laughs> oh my gosh. Those, congratulations. Thank you all who entered, um, but congratulations uh, yes. to our winners. To all the winners. And don't forget to send us your info so we can mail you your custom We Three Queens plaque fan from Plaque That Fan. Yes. They are beautiful and you will be clacking and slaying all the day through. And you know who else are winners in this whole beautiful experience of ours? Whitman Walker Health. As of today, 
we got word that we have raised a total of $1,565 for trans health and legal services. So that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. We shattered our stretch goal. You guys are amazing. The link to donate will still be active, I believe for the next year, if I'm not mistaken. So please feel free to toss any of your extra money their way. I'm sure it will be much appreciated, but thank you guys so, so much for that and for helping us raise so much money for such an amazing cause. So now that all of that is done, we're gonna segue over to the Q&A where we're gonna open the floor for you guys to ask us your burning questions, whether it's about you know the show, how we put it together, how to get on the cast of the next show, um, or just questions you have for any of us about our experiences in the queer community, fire away. I have our first question. Um, Kathy missed the first part of the of the live stream, so she just asked who won the first category. Um, Kathy, <laughs> the winner of the first category is Nico Granados. If you have not seen that video, please go to our Instagram page. It. She was serving, honey. She was. Yes. Serving. <laughs> and let's. Uh, we can also take a moment to remind everyone that we do. We did just start a YouTube channel. Um, and we made a compilation video of all the contestants and all the categories. So you can check it out on YouTube. Just search uh, We Three Queens Productions and it'll be posted on top. I'm sure Kenny's working his magic and making a link below or something. Making a link in the comments. If check not, I just gave him more work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Give Our us a little subscribe. <laughs> um, and then I want to take a moment to... Uh, also thank our cast, um, our beautiful, delicious, hugely talented cast. Um, the evening in the event, the visibility, the, 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 the visibility show event would not have been an event without them. Um, and so thank you all who were, uh, uh, who participated. And if there aren't any questions, I have a question for each of you. Oh. Is oh Kenny, so Kenny, you're our question keeper. I am, sorry, I'm oh. <laughs> the comment in the, the, the YouTube link. In oh, the, the see, he was busy doing the last thing I asked him to do. Kenny, we'll talk about your, why this would not have happened without you in a moment, but uh, do we have any questions? So far, I do not think so. So I would, again, just to talk about the cast and how wonderful they were, because uh, I would like to ask you all what your favorite performance or what your highlights in the performance um, section, uh, or even just in the show itself, what was like a highlight for you? Oh my goodness. Uh, really well, hard. I can say um, I didn't get to, uh, Sean, it, for those who aren't aware, Sean was our talent acquisition guru um, and had most of the contact with our performers. Um, but one of the performers I did get to work with was Angel, Chris, uh, who did some aerial work. So there are a few things that, one of the reasons that's one of my top things is because I had never gotten to see aerial work, and I was part of the film, uh, uh, part of the filming crew for that. Um, as well as I got to be there when he was recording his singing, which not I don't know that everybody caught that he was actually the person singing the song to which he was performing, um, and so getting to be part of every aspect of that was really a. a fun experience for me and I feel like I made a really good friend in the process <laughs> you know it's funny um it's interesting I've known I think Angel is one of my longest friends like I, we have known each other since probably like 92 93 um which is like 20 gone I just aged myself but <laughs> you know it was interesting to be in a room where I've known Angel, um, I sometimes call him Chris because that's what, what we, that we, but it was Angel. Um, and then to also have one of my newest 
lifelong friends in the room because Gary and I, we, if you don't know, if you guys want, if anyone watching doesn't know, um, Gary kind of killed me in a show. <laughs> Just that one time every night. That one time every night. It wasn't a big deal. But um, that was interesting. And Gary, you really impressed me. You busted it. You, you busted out a sound, like a sound room made out of yoga props. Um, <laughs> You know, we hung blankets up, which thank you, Live Out Loud Yoga and La Plata um, for allowing us the space and the um, the aerial who uh, the lyra and the, the hammock. Um, you busted it out, dude. I was. It was a, it was an interesting day. Uh, actually, Kenny, I'm yes. sending something to our group chat. If you want to toss up a uh, picture that I took from that day of our uh, improv improvised sound booth. <laughs> that's amazing. I just got it and that's amazing. Uh, this so is, uh, it, well, what was amazing was that uh, Angel actually got it in what would have been one take. It was, it ended up being two because there was a text message that went off in the middle of the recording. <laughs> But that's uh, that's how you make a sound booth on the fly. <laughs> Out of yoga blankets and a ladder. And, and a ladder. And that's lots it. of clips. That is the cutest thing I've ever seen. I know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Angel landed that in one one take. It was funny because yeah, he was like, uh, it was like right after the take, he was like, damn you, Katrina. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, but uh, I'll throw it up. Uh, what was someone else's uh, highlight of the evening? Um, truthfully, I'm I'm going to be real and honest. My highlight, because I was the only person to have seen the finale <laughs> else. So I finished the finale, being really candid, everyone. I finished the finale like an hour before, before showtime. Yeah. What? <laughs> Theater people finishing something just before it goes on? I've never heard of such a Jeez. thing. I put it into the video and I exported it and I was like I'm the only one who has seen this and everybody else was going to see it live with everyone else so in our group chat <laughs> I was like here comes the finale I hope you guys are ready and then just reading the comments like Sean I'm crying drink here. <laughs> the whole finale was just me it was crazy I was dancing I was crying happy tears and having to chug my drink because I was just crying. I was just so happy with how the finale turned out. You, and great segue into why we need to give a shout out to Kenny. Kenny, our technical director. Um, you, you know, you know, I remember seeing some of like when you were starting to push, piece these things together. And I, I think it was the uh, opening credits with the whole entire cast. That was when I, my mind was blown because I wasn't even thinking this is good. That was this was going to be the quality of this production, and then you set the bar up for yourself, dude. I was just like, oh, dude. <laughs> this is what hey, you get when you do good got work. Some Congratulations, your reward is more work. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that oh that oh, I was I was dancing like oh I love the finale. Well, what was really uh, speaking to that, Kenny absolutely took the reins of the technical aspect of this. And uh, the, th the three of us, Kenny, Sean, and myself, kind of fell into our roles right away. And then about, I want to say like a third of the way into the process, Finn got involved. And right away, loved everything about them. <laughs> Um, and there was, uh, there was a, a moment where we were having a, a meeting via Zoom, much like this one. And I actually was like, hey, Finn, could you, could you please mute it so you can't hear what we're saying? And Finn, bless you, <laughs> muted themselves so that we couldn't hear them. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay with all their skills, we need to make them the marketing director because basically they got this. And 
Sean and Kenny pointed out that they basically had just muted themselves. <laughs> and I, I said, I didn't, yeah. <laughs> this is asked by Kathy. Um, how old were you when you knew your orientation? Ooh. I guess I'll, if you guys don't mind, I'll, I'll go first. Sure. Um, so I knew I was different at five because like everybody else in preschool was like all the little boys are chasing after little girls and I'm just like, he's cute. <laughs> it didn't register that I the, the word gay was, was there. I, I, I want to say I put myself, I, I gave myself that label at like 13, but then at like 30 I said, um, I'm, I'm pansexual. I Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> all the things all the things <laughs> i remember uh mine down to the day it was november 17th 2001 it was my junior year um <laughs> kenny might remember uh some of these names and finn you might recognize a couple um but uh it was in high school it was my junior year and we just did pride and prejudice and we were at the cast party and kind of like Kenny, I kind of knew I had those moments of like, Oh, you know, you take a little extra longer looking at the guy next to you getting dressed or undressed in the gym uh, in the locker room or your science teacher just gives you a, a little bit excited about learning about the earth. Um, but uh, Aaron Gann was in the, sh in the, in the show and Mike Peppley went to Westlake yeah. and he was at our cast party and Mike Peppley and I had, like, we were just getting along and Mike had left and I turned over to Erin cause she was sitting right there. And I was like, I think I'm gay. And that's, <laughs> that was how I first came out. It was to Erin Gann and it was at Una Miller's house. I don't know if anyone remembers that name, but yeah, that was honest. Mike Peppley is a beautiful man. Oh my goodness. And he's very, yeah, he was very sweet. And, you know, back in, I mean, this was like 2000, 2000, this was 2001. Very different times. You know, there wasn't like, there wasn't like any other gay kids in high school, um, at least not at La Plata at the time. So to meet someone who was like me, I was just like, <sighs> and he is, just, he's really sweet. Um, yeah, Mike Peppley. So yeah, that's that that was my moment. I guess um, I'll be next. I had um well, technically speaking, I've come out three times. Um the first time I I mean I knew I was different, kind of like Kenny. I knew I was different from a very early age. I didn't know to what degree. Um, but I would say right around the time I was like six or seven, when I first started getting kind of cognizant of myself. Um, as a being in the world, I knew that I was not like other people assigned female at birth. I knew something was different, but I couldn't, you know, identify it, of course. Then when I was about 12 was when I realized that anyone and everyone was attractive. And I was so in love with being in love that I really didn't care who it was. Um, it could be a girl it could be a guy it could be non-binary people weren't really I mean they were a thing but they weren't really a thing that had a label um but that was when I, I came out when I as bisexual when I was 13 and then um I came out as non-binary right around the time that term was first coined so that was in college maybe about like sophomore junior year so that would have been like 2009 um and then finally, I came out about my top surgery, my masculinizing top surgery, uh, which I guess was my way of coming out as trans, um, still non-binary, just trans masculine non-binary. Um, and that was two and a half months ago. <laughs> so um, that's, I'm relatively baby when it comes to that, but I had a feeling that I was always different. And now I'm finally starting to fill that wonderful pair of shoes in the fullest and I'm very, very happy about it. <laughs> you had your top yeah. three, what, a week before the show went up? 
It was, I have, my top surgery was August 5th and we went up on August 17th, I think. 21st. 21st, yeah. that's right. It was supposed to be the 17th we pushed it. Um, so yeah, it was about two weeks. Shh, don't tell them our secrets. <laughs> <laughs> it was about two weeks after uh, the top surgery happened. At the time, the, the interview that I, that I conducted with, uh, with Sean was actually taken, I want to say it was like five days after I got back from Miami because my surgery was in Miami. Um, so I was still a T-Rex. I, I couldn't lift my arms past here. Um, you know, I still had uh, all kinds of stuff going on. <laughs> I still couldn't move very well. Um, so if I seemed like a T-Rex and I wasn't articulating terribly, it's because the teats had been yeeted and I was not very flexible in that regard. <laughs> Yeet the teats. Yeet the teats. That interview was actually over an hour long. I cut it down to like nine minutes and like the the entire interview, I'm just looking at Finn like, oh God, do they need a break? <laughs> Pause for a moment. Do they need to move around? <laughs> we were on it. We were, we were, we, we got into like a nice conversation about um, a lot of current topics and some very informative stuff. So yeah, go to the YouTube ch page, check it out. Um, yes. Finn, I have to say, I thought it was um it felt like an honorary experience having you um when you became when you uh, signed up and we brought you on to help out with the show um because you've said this before you just said it um your um that journey that you took you know we, we weren't it was one of those things like we didn't come up to be like hey Finn, we want to film you and follow you for the next three weeks on your journey. You know, it was like the way the world worked and the universe worked, you know, you brought us, you, we brought you, cause I reached out to you to be um, a performer in an interview and then we brought you on, but then you, you got to go on this journey and we got to be a, pretty much like a front row seat to it. Um, yeah. Pretty and, much you guys talked to me on uh, one of our Zoom meetings was actually the day before I went under. Yeah. <laughs> so they've seen uh, these three, these three queens have seen me through um, an entire evolution in myself. And actually our audience members have as well, because fun fact, I filmed my performance uh, to Bang by Adger. I filmed my performance before before I got top surgery and I filmed the interview after I got top surgery. So it's almost like our audience members got to see a full evolution of a trans person in a, what, in what is a massive step in transition for a lot of people. So it was crazy for me watching it back again to like see the difference in my countenance, the difference in my psychology, the difference in even the look on my face between the first video and the between the performance and the interview it was like watching a different person i was like holy crap <laughs> and yeah and to be a uh, spontaneous uh part of that journey and just to be able to witness it um and kind of get like this front row account is something i never thought i would have that experience of you know i never thought in my wildest dreams i would be like oh you know this is what a tr you know what transitioning looks like this is what masking is uh the shirt uh, we to teats looks like this is what this looks like and to actually be <laughs> up front because we had all these different meetings it was really a wonderful experience an eye-opening experience is something that i probably won't have the same i won't have that experience ever again so i just want to thank you for that and for um bringing that it, it really was an honor to be for you to offer that as so openly to us as a learning experience. So thank you very much. I it, literally the first time we met, that's like one of the first things you mentioned. <laughs> well, I was pretty damn excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> We're sitting there waiting for Sean to arrive on the, this is the first time that Finn and I had ever met. We're sitting on a Zoom meeting. It's just the two of us waiting for yes, Sean to arrive. Everyone, and... I am always late, even in <laughs> Zoom, I am always late. <laughs> and. We're just talking and Finn's just like, by the way, I haven't mentioned this to anybody really, but <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. 
I was like, that's before the show. Uh, okay. What it, do you was one of, it was one of those things. Like I, I felt it pertinent to mention it because, you know, it was right before the show. And I was like, I'm probably, uh, there's a chance that for a couple of weeks there, I may be out of commission. So from a practical standpoint, I was like, I have to let them know. But from a not so practical standpoint, when you're taking this gigantic step as a trans person, you are so damn excited about it. You are so hyped. You are so stoked. You are so gassed about it. And you want to tell every human being that you come across, like that old lady in Target in the freaking, you know, underwear aisle, you just want to run up to her and say, hi, I'm cutting my breasts off. Um, you just Merry get Christmas so, so house. <laughs> Exactly. I'm eating my teeth. Nice to meet you. Um, but you, you know, to a certain degree, you can't uh, tell everyone and there's certain people for some more than others, but I was lucky enough that I didn't really feel unsafe talking about it. Um, but for some people, it can be a very unsafe thing to bring this up. So then you have a, a thing that you're so excited about, but you can't tell anyone because you never know if someone's going to react negatively to it. So even having only known Gary for a little while, I was like, okay, Minutes. A little while is minutes. Minutes. <laughs> Even with only knowing Gary for a few minutes, I was like, this is a safe place for me. And that was what I loved so much about the concept of We Three Queens as I joined the team was it immediately felt like a place of safety. It, it immediately felt like somewhere where I could be excited about my transness and that wasn't going to be a problem. <laughs> It wasn't going to be something that people had to deal with or that people had to put up with me talking about. Um, and one of my main goals, having had top surgery and having had this trans experience, is to educate people about it. I want to talk about the things that don't get talked about. I want to be the, the place where people can come for questions if they're afraid to ask these questions for fear of being judged too harshly or for fear of coming off the wrong way. I want to be that person that they can come to and say, hey, I've been wanting to know this for a long time, but I'm scared to ask a trans person. I want to be that trans person because the more we lift the veil that has kept trans, you know, transness hidden for so long, the closer we'll get, I think, to full equality because with, with understanding comes social equality um, because we're kind of on the same page. So yeah. You know, I figure it's not safe for a bunch of people to be out, so I might as well be out for them. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is we want trans people to be more visible. <laughs> visible, exactly. <laughs> we want visibility and visibility is not safe for everyone. So I figure while I can be visible, I am going to be so visible. <laughs> yeah, that was um one of our, I'm glad you said that because that was one of our original attempts was to provide a safe space for people to be visible and so Gary what was yours I want to hear yours oh my coming out story uh-huh or my, my realization story uh it's very short-lived uh I was dating a lovely girl named Gina <laughs> and it was Valentine's Day uh I was 15 and I went home and I thought to myself Gina's nice and all, and she is nice. Gina's nice and all, but you know who I really like? That Alexander kid. <laughs> and uh, I just kind of like, as I, I remember like walking up the driveway and thinking that to myself and then just kind of stopping in the driveway and, oh, okay. And I mean, I had some inklings leading up to it. I was certainly the most fabulous on my street, but. <laughs> Yeah, 15-year-old uh, Gary just realized it and ran with it. T ended up taking a guy to prom my senior year. And yeah, I this queen embraced. We love it. That definitely sounds like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just if I don't realize something, I am oblivious. The moment I realize something, I try to know as much as I can. And I'm I at the grabbing and running. You're just, you're oh. one of those kids. You're like, oh, oh. and you're just off. I want to touch it. I want to know it. I want to feel. All right, Finn, um, just a 
it's, this is a kudos um, from Kathy. That is so brave of you, Finn, because it is helpful when we know and understand more of what matters to you and why. Oh, I appreciate Kathy, um, I love Kathy is a wonderful woman. Um, she's a producer. Uh, I, Finn, I don't know if you know. Uh... Oh, man. Sorry. Uh, I don't know if you know Kathy or not. Uh, Kathy is just a wonderful woman. I love her. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. Gary, we have a question for you. Oh, what's up? Gary, what was the reaction when you took a guy to prom? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mama comes from a smaller town in Pennsylvania. Uh, but big enough that it, it's Erie, Erie, Pennsylvania. If this is Pennsylvania, we're the thumb. Anyway. <laughs> and uh, taking a guy to prom, mom and dad didn't know at the time that I was taking a guy to prom because I was very busy with rehearsals. And I would like to say a shout out and thank you to Richard Davis from the Erie Playhouse. Uh, I think he's the artistic director currently. And at the time he had cast me in a show, Children of Eden, and he helped me get dressed for prom right after rehearsal. Um, I took this guy that I didn't know very well, but he was gay. So of course we had to go together, um, but he wasn't from my school. And at first there was some pushback when I first like bought my ticket and said, hi, I'm taking this person to prom. Uh, there's some, a little bit of administrative push, pushback and I had some very supportive teachers. I'm a, I'm a very lucky person in my coming out story and in my whole life uh, that I had support from all sides. I had support from my family. Although I was still a little nervous about like pushing open those doors with my family for a little bit, not because of anything they did, but um, my projection of how they would react onto them is what slowed me down. Uh, but the teachers in my school were aware, the teachers I had been close with, I made them aware. They were very protective. Um, and they kind of like stood up to admin about that. And I got into prom. Um, and then at prom, nobody really gave us a hard time, but a big part of that was there were always like, if I looked over my shoulder, there was always a teacher who was kind of, one of those protective teachers was always kind of there, just keeping an eye out on things. And uh, the real disappointing thing of that whole experience was that he didn't like to dance. Oh. So he sat down and I went to that dance floor and honey, I tore it up. <laughs> You do, girl loves to dance, that is true. <laughs> so yeah, I, I am a very lucky person. Uh, I think I was the first guy to take a guy at my high school. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a very positive experience. And uh, one of the keys to being able to have a positive experience in any of these things is the support system you have. It, uh, we, when in like things like National Coming Out Day come around, lots of people shout out, yes, it's important to come out, come out, even if you don't feel safe. I am a big proponent for coming out if it is safe for you. Yeah. Um, and, it, and come out to people for whom it is safe for you to do so, or with whom it is safe for you to do so. Um, your journey is your journey and nobody can know what, what choices you need to make to be able to live out your life how you want to, so. Um, as I said, I'm thankful for my support system. And if you are in need of a support system, please reach out. I will gladly be an advocate for you. I will, and I'm sure every single one of We Three Queens members will be glad to be a support system, a resource, an advocate for you. And that brings up a really interesting point too, the internalized phobia that we sometimes feel I mean, when I was first coming to terms with my gender identity, I was in a very safe place to do that. I was at St. Mary's College of Maryland getting my bachelor's degree in theater, film, and media studies. And I was like, so, you know, St. Mary's, I mean, it was known since 
uh, the 60s as being like a big hippie school. It's a liberal arts college. So it's like very queer, very open, very accepting, very friendly. Um, so I was in a very safe place to explore those things. But even there, I was like, am I non-binary or am I just trying to get attention? <laughs> you know, am I bisexual or am I just secretly a lesbian or secretly straight and I don't want anyone to know? So with this homophobia and transphobia and biphobia that existed in our culture and proceed, you know, persists to this day, we are kind of brought up with this internalized phobia where we're like, wait, am I? Or am I not? Am I an imposter? Am I just attention seeking? Am I like, you know, we get all of these doubts in our heads and I've heard so much about it from trans youth. Um, I'm a member of many Facebook groups that are support groups for trans people. And I see youth in there all the time, you know, young teens who are like, I think I'm trans. I've kind of always known I'm trans. I feel like I'm in the wrong body, like the full nine yards, but I feel like I might just be seeking attention and I'm like, boo, no, <laughs> no, you're not. Like if you're trans, you're trans, it's okay. Like it's, you know, you don't have to be afraid of yourself. And little did I know, you know, like I said in my interview, which you can catch on our We Three Queens YouTube channel um, in its entirety, I was, you know, when well, I was non-binary and I was firmly non-binary, but something still wasn't quite right. And I was like, no, I was like, no, I don't, I don't need to transition. Like I'm, I'm not binary. I'm not trans enough to transition. And I have to give a huge shout out to Kyle White and Anita Minute. They're both my drag parents. Um, they are beautiful. Justin Sane and Anita Minute. They are an actual married couple. Um, Justin Sane is a amazing, amazing person. And he was actually the one who approached me and said, why do you think you don't deserve to transition? And I was like, I don't know, I'm just, I'm non-binary. I'm not like binary trans where I want to, you know, hop from one end of the spectrum to the other. I just want to fall somewhere in the middle, but I feel like I don't deserve that. And I swear he almost slapped me upside my head so hard I could see him next week because he was like, you deserve transition. If transition is the goal, then that is what you deserve. That is what you, if that's what you need to be more comfortable with yourself, don't worry about, there are no parameters for transition. Like <laughs> you can, there's nothing you have to do. There's nothing, you know, that is like a prerequisite. You don't have to be trans enough. Um, and that's part of another form of transphobia called transmedicalism. Well, here, which um is or you keep going with it. Um, I want you to finish, but we do have some, I believe there are some pending questions. Um, oh, sure, sure, sure. Which were, yeah. We get to those as well. Well, I want to know what that is, though. Yes. Ben. Transmedicalism? <laughs> yes. So transmedicalism is the idea that in order to consider yourself transgender, you have to have either, you have to have gender dysphoria, which is the psychological effects of feeling like you're in the wrong body, or you have to have medically transitioned in some way, meaning you have to have had surgery, been on hormone therapy or both. Um, so transmedicalism is the idea that those things are requirements for you to belong to the trans community. And so it's, a, it's kind of a form of prejudice. Yes, very much so. Mm. And it was actually a form of prejudice that existed within the trans community about itself. <laughs> So uh, it was something that the trans community has only just now come to terms with in the last year or so. All right, the first question is 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 from my good friend Marquise Fair. Um, da -da 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 -da. Hang on. Since queer is such a broad category, how does one who I who initially identified as queer because it's so broad and embraces um, and embracing? Sorry. To a different to a different identification. So I guess it's if you identify as queer for so long, but you have transcended that that word. Um, can you repeat the? Can you repeat it again? Yes. Yes. How does one who initially identifies as queer because it's so broad and embracing to a different identification? Okay. 
I think I see what's what's going on. So basically, you've identified as queer for so long, you want to get more specific, but you don't know how. Um, I'll actually say I did identify. So when I first realized I liked men, I identified as gay. And then I had an experience in college. No. <laughs> uh, it wasn't all it was cracked out to be, but I had a sexual attraction to a woman. And so for a little bit, I identified as queer because I knew that my sexual attraction to her uh, was not purely physical sexual attraction. And so I, I started to impose my own definition onto queer um, because it gives a little bit of leeway. And I was like, well, I only had a strong emotional attraction and that's what drew me sexually. Um, and ultimately I ended up coming back to gay. And that is going to be a, a something that can be very, very hard to define for an individual. It's like what really makes them feel secure. And that's, I think, what the point of any sort of label a person gives themselves, whether it is because it is broad or because it is specific, it is to make them feel secure and comfortable enough to breathe, to stretch, to be themselves. Um, the purpose of labeling for any individual, it, it, the purpose of labeling for an individual should be to make them feel safe and confident. Question, and this one's, when I read it, I was like, stop. Um, <laughs> it's from it's from Marquise again. He says, I see you all as trailblazers and also mentors. Do you have any, do you have any advice on, on how someone like him can be a great mentor? Side question. Is it easier to mentor on a platform like We Three Queens or individual one-on-one? -on -one? Um, you're about to make me cry again. <laughs> so I hope we gave a pair of shots. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, thank you. Um, I, I guess I never really thought about that. You know, I always remember I always go back to why we created this. And I think I'm still living in this bubble and in like, like we're all theater people. Um, you know, the show just closed. We're now at the cast party and we're like, oh my gosh, we did so good. I haven't really had time to, exactly, we will be, yes. Um, I haven't had time to really process all of that. Um, so that's really a huge compliment to say that we're trailblazers. Um, you know, my goal from the beginning was to, yeah, like what Finn said, create a space that allowed all the colors of the queer rainbow of the LGBTQ family um, to be shown. Um, I will say, though, I think it would be easier. I think it might be easier for us to mentor on a We Three Queens platform than it is in solo. Um, but I think that kind of depends on location, um, what environment you're in. Um, you know, I, you know, most of us are, we're in the same general vicinity and Marquise, you're in the same area as us. Cause I know you, um, you know, in Southern Maryland, you know, especially during COVID, um, where everything is, you know, we're still social distancing and we're still practicing these boundaries. Um, I found that people have really turned to the internet and turned to Zoom and turned to online platforms. And we're going to be here for a while. Um, so that is why I think it might be easier for us to do this virtually um, than it is in person. So could we start a, a We Three Queens mentorship? This is not a, an official business meeting. We can't make these decisions publicly like this. <laughs> Although I do think We Three Queens gives us a unique platform because it already has that space established. So whereas if you're doing one-on-one -on -one mentoring, which I've done in the past, people aren't sure what they can and can't talk to you about. They're, they haven't built this sort of rapport, this sort of relationship. But when you come into We Three Queens, you're coming into an already accepting space. So it's like, okay, I know that I am not going to be judged here. I know that I'm going to be welcomed here. I And it kind of gets rid of that awkwardness in the beginning. It's like a community settle. center. Yeah, where you can just easily settle into, okay, I'm safe. 
And as for becoming a, a better mentor yourself for other people, first of all, I think that's an amazing quality to have. Not every queer person is willing to put themselves out there in that way to be a mentor for other people. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing that takes a lot of bravery to do. I think the most important thing for me when it comes to being a good mentor, which I always strive to be, is learning from my own experiences. Because all too often we tend to kind of disassociate from our experiences, especially when they're difficult. And all of the times that I had been misgendered, all of the times that I had been criticized, all of the times that I had been discriminated against or been, you know, at the forefront of bigotry or hatred or criticism, I observed that and I learned as much as I could from those experiences, from how I was feeling. I remembered and internalized everything because it was important for me to have that knowledge going into working with younger people because I wanna be able to say, all right, you wanna come out, this, this, and this might happen. And this is how you react to it, at least if you're me. And then when I went and got the teeth needed, um, I embodied every bit of that pain, every bit of that discomfort, every bit of that experience, every weird thing that happened, I made a record of it because I knew that I was going to want to teach other people about this eventually. And I wanted to remember all of the quirky, weird things that happened that nobody talks about. Um, I remember this. I've got a quick, quick, quick thing about the mentor thing. I'll be super fast. Um, one of the biggest things, if you uh, want to be a good mentor uh, and any leader in life in general, a mentor who is willing to say, I don't know the answer, let me help you find somebody who does. Um, throughout this whole experience, there are so many things that each of us didn't know about the world that we were trying to highlight and feature with this, with the visibility show. Um, and from the beginning, we went into it saying, this isn't our story. Let's not try to tell it for the people who, who should tell it. Uh, so if you don't know the answer, find the person who does. I was so thankful to find people like Savannah Wanzer. Uh, I was so thankful to find people like uh, Paul Grace Neal. I was so thankful to find people like Finn because I did not know about the trans community and I shouldn't have been speaking for the trans community. I needed to learn from the trans community and right off that soapbox. All right, Finn, um, Christy Morales has a question. Um, it's mostly geared towards you, but anyone can answer. Um, she said that my friend who was a teacher wants to know to support a non-binary high school student who's trying to find their way. Are there any resources? Wonderful. Um, first of all, thank you for supporting and affirming the non-binary community. There are a lot of people who don't. <laughs> and so it's a beautiful thing to see that support. Um, the easiest way that you yourself can support and affirm a non-binary individual, use their chosen pronouns, use their chosen name. You would be shocked at the absolute euphoria on a person, on a non-binary person's face when someone addresses them as they. I still remember to this very moment, the first time my spouse called me by my preferred name. And this is a man who I have been married to for nearly a decade. He has seen me through this entire process. He saw me through right from when I was 19 years old and firmly in my non-binary realm and, you know, fully andro, fully, you know, fuck the patriarchy, fully all of that all the way through this phase of hyper femininity that I went through when I was sort of denying myself the privilege of transition all the way through until now, um, you know, holding my hand and helping me through this top surgery experience. And the first time it was actually around our friends, um, around, you know, a couple of friends of mine. And the first time he called me Finn, the, I, almost cried right then and there because here was a person who had only ever known me by my original name all the way up through until now and it was like and he, it was very casual he didn't even like he didn't make a big deal of it which is also important you know don't make a big show out of it because all non-binary and trans people want 
is to be treated like everybody else. We just want to be treated like everybody else through the lens of where we're comfortable and where we're safe and affirmed. So when he was like, oh yeah, I was talking to Finn about that the other day. I almost didn't notice it. I was like, uh, you just, oh. <laughs> to, like go hide behind the car and like get my composure really quickly we were helping them move so it was like a whole thing but um that will make a person's day addressing them by they them pronouns addressing them by their preferred name asking them if they have a preferred name you know and 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 using it and sometimes that preferred name will change you know it'll say especially when you're dealing with younger kids uh, um or teens like a high school student would be like, oh yeah, I used to want to be called Jax, but now I kind of want to be called Alex. And then it's like, okay, just jump right into that. Uh, and that can take a little bit of cognitive gymnastics, but I promise it's worth it because non-binary people have a lot to offer the world. Um, there are lots and lots of trans and non-binary groups on Facebook, and that's the easiest way to connect with other non-binary people. There's not a whole lot of like official charity work that's devoted to non-binary as an identity just yet, but a lot of the trans charities and the trans awareness groups are adopting non-binary because non-binary is under the trans umbrella. So definitely seek those places out, um, you know, kind of educate yourself as much as you can. But a lot of it is just the simple little things that can completely affirm someone and make someone's life, you know, if they're having a day where they're kind of having a bit of a moment and they're just not feeling themselves or maybe they had a negative experience with their family being non-binary or they've been dead named or whatever the case may be, you know, I find some of the most touching and helpful things that I can do is just call them by their chosen name over and over and over and over again. You know, like um, one of the teenagers that I used to work with uh, his chosen name was Alex and uh, Alexander and his family, he had just gone up to his family's house for Thanksgiving and spent the entire time being dead named, spent the entire time being misgendered, spent the entire time in this dysphoric nightmare. Um, and he came back and he was like almost in tears. The poor kid looked like he had been dragged through hell and back. And this was before COVID, of course, because I could actually touch people. And I just grabbed the sides of his face and I went, Alex, 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 Alex. And I just said it over and over and over and over and over again. And you just saw slowly that smile return to his face. I said, Alex, you are the most beautiful human I've ever seen. Now let's go do something else fun. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, um, that reminded me of uh, like Paul's, Paul's performance. Um, which I found so powerful was the beginning part where um, Paul was, I, he kept saying, I'm a black trans man, I'm a black trans man, I'm a black trans man, and echoing that. Um, I would like to give a resource, and it's, I think it's one of the reasons why um, we decided to raise money for them, and it's Whitman Walker. Um, Whitman Walker itself uh, has a ton of resources. Um, they do tons of work with the LGBTQ plus community, especially the trans community, like Finn said, non-binary, non-binary kind of falls under that, that it falls under that umbrella. Um, yeah, they're in DC, but you know, everything is done online now. Um, they would be a good, something local as well. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, that would be a good resource and they have, would have a lot of other, um, connections as well. I think that uh, that'd be a good answer to that question. Definitely. Um, so the next two questions are geared towards me, but I, I literally want everybody else to answer as well because this is it's a heavy question. Um, do you think there are any specific difference for mentoring TQA people of color versus their white counterparts? Is there a difference? That was the question. Is there a difference? Well, answer is, go for it, Kenny. Yeah, go. <laughs> I already got my answer, but go. I mean, there's one of the things that I was told when I first came out was the world is already hard enough for a black man. Now it's going to be even harder for you being a black gay man. And I was like, oh, God, what? Why? Um, 
all I got to say is it's it's easier to mentor when it's easier to get information and to feel comfortable with someone when they look like you. That's that's just how it is. Um, because we know each other's struggles. We know we know pretty much each other's not really life, but more we know how to take care of ourselves. Um, anybody, please. Um, I will say, yes, it is very different for mentoring a black uh, indigenous person of color who is LGBTQ plus versus a white LGBTQ plus person, because if you are mentoring an, a white LGBTQ plus person, you need to in, uh, uh, ingrain in them that it is, we have a responsibility to be good allies. It is our responsibility to be good allies to our community. And as Kenny said, being a black person already difficult being a gay black person so much more difficult uh being a black trans person so much more difficult um i mean there uh finn is is a uh supporter and is involved with i believe uh i don't know if that's the official wording but with the uh black trans lives matter movement um yeah, that, that is the big key. There, everybody in the LGBTQ plus community is going to be facing some form of oppression probably in their life. Um, and for the white community, it's our job to be good allies and to fight and interrupt racism whenever we encounter it. Indeed. It's a concept called intersectionalism. It's the idea that our you know, when you're a part of more than one marginalized group, one experience of oppression does not cancel out the other. If anything, they compound on one another. So if you are black, there's systemic racism in the United States that's gonna make your life a little bit harder. If you are trans, there's transphobia intrinsic in the United States that's gonna make your life a little bit harder. If you are a black trans woman, it compounds on itself and you get bigotry and hatred and complications in your existence from both being black and being trans. And so for me, yes, I'm a trans person and I will always have input to offer about my experience as a trans person. But the minute a black trans woman opens their mouth, I shut mine because they have an experience that I can't even hold a candle to. And it's something that you know, listening to black trans women speak is something that is a special kind of education. It's gonna tear your heart out, but it is a special kind of education and you'll be a better person for it. So even as a trans person, I always try to give space to my trans siblings of color because they're even more marginalized than I am. I, um, I remember uh, bringing it back to the show. Um, I remember, I guess, you know, I'm 36 years old. Um, I might not be able to use words that have 10 letters and all this, that fancy stuff, but you know, I know how the world works, but I remember early on when it was a Saturday or no, it was a Sunday where I was, it was like the first meeting with all the cat, with most of the cast members. Um, and it was one of the first times that I talked to Finn. Um, and I had spent the whole entire Sunday. I had meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. I think I probably met with five, six of out of the nine cast members that day. It was a lot. Um, I walked away with that because none of our cast members, well, so I walked away with at the end of that day after all those meetings, every single person, every single interview that I had, discussion meeting that I had, you all said the same thing. And that was at some point in their life, they had to explain that being gay or being queer or being part of the LGBT community does not mean you're white and gay. And that society, you know, when they, when they came out or when they were talking to people, people had that assumption like, oh, you're gay, you're not white or 
you're not male and you like men like that's what society instantly put on us uh, on, on them on all of you um you all had that moment of having that's not what being in the lgbt community means um so my answer is yes you know it's completely different um and they've all echoed that but that was a moment for me in the show where i kind of realized whoa like we're really we're really on to something and we're doing this right um and i'm so proud of being able to have that inclusion um you know with a lot of the things that are going on um and kind of what gary said uh you know if you don't know which i didn't know a lot about the trans community if fins opened my eyes up to that you find someone who seeks the answer and tying it back to what i said is we're kind of like a community center i kind of feel like that is what i kind of we all wanted this to be to give visibility to all the members of our community so people can see what all the colors of the rainbow look like and to be feel like they're more accepted to feel like they're more welcoming and you know we can become that connecting point um because this is this is continuing on this we three queens is not dying after this um but to be able to continue being a resource um and that's where i kind of see where we three queens is going but the answer to the question yeah mentoring yeah it would be completely different i would uh, i would take i would take if i were mentoring uh, uh anyone who is indigenous person of color the majority uh, the major, uh, world majority i would say we're taking a trip to nashville an hour outside of nashville and we're going to meet one of my best friends his name is kenny and kenny is going to teach you a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> hi kenny <laughs> that's what i would do if i was mentoring someone who i would not be able to answer things for um, partnership i there are, there are no more questions there's a bunch of um kathy me once again says the honesty of this group is incredible um so gary's gonna kill me for this but we haven't talked about doing a podcast so that might happen soon <laughs> just, Ooh, that would be fun just just all of us just talking so that way <laughs> yeah there we go I will not kill you. I uh, I think this would be a fun endeavor, and I think it would be beneficial. We, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from our audience about some of the education, and we'd love to keep talking, as you can tell, because we continue to ramble. All right. This will be the last question, and then we're going to wrap things up. But um, so Marquise has another question, and this one, this was the <laughs> time as a trans person in theater that you feel shame or embarrassed in dressing rooms? Should there be a trans dressing room? Hmm. Mm. See, so, say no, but it, oh. It's tough, it's tough. Um, while I think that there are justifications for that, particularly in the realm of dressing rooms, um, we also have genderless bathrooms. So I think if we can have gender free bathrooms, we can have gender free just about anything with the right accommodations. Um, with with bathrooms, of course, it's kind of different because you can just put everybody in a stall and call it a day. Dressing rooms, in particular theater dressing rooms, are a very, very different experience. Now for me, as a drag king who was assigned female at birth, pre-top surgery, I always felt a little bit self-conscious in a dressing room because, you know, you're stripping down to your bare nuggets and people are going to be like, oh, okay, I, I know who that is. I know what that is. I can assign things to that. And so I see the merit of having a transgender dressing room, but I would even take it another direction and just do like my dream would be cubicles of little curtains like little cubicles of dressing curtains and just make a gender free dressing room. Just a fun, fun fact. Yeah. Roxy does not have male female dressing rooms. They, it's just like, it's just like, it's, it's curtain cubicles. And there are three main dressing rooms downstairs that can be used for whatever. Because how, I'm not speaking for him, but like how our executive director is like, 
we're inclusive. So why separate? And I'm sorry, Kenny, what, what theater was that? We didn't quite hear that. Proxy Regional Theater. That's where I work. Because, yeah, I'm thinking um, about all the shows that I've been in. And, you know, in the theater world, I feel like it's a little bit different than the real world. Um, I feel like when you when you're in the theater and you're in a show and you're rehearsing for three months, um, you know, I want to I, I can't talk about that because that really doesn't have my point. But, you know, I've been on some big musicals, uh, Elf the Musical, which I was in for the, over the holidays. Huge. I had like 50 people. It was huge. But in the theater world and in that family that we created with the show, you know, we would have girls that would come to the men's room and do their makeup and do other things. And they knew that the men had to change. Um, it be kind of became like this fluid inners and outwards and the women's dressing room kind of became its own little thing, but the men's room kind of became a little segue, a little segue. Now that I'm thinking about, I've been in other shows where it's been more intense. Um, you know, pajama game way back in the day, Kenny. Um, you know. Dressing room, what was that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was literally like, you dressed anywhere you wanted, Beauty and the Beast. You kind of dressed anywhere you wanted, um, but no one was judging you. And that was, I think that's the important thing. And that's the thing I'm trying to highlight. Because in the theater world, usually everyone's very welcoming and we're very loving and you spend so much time. Um, so, I, I don't think I could answer that question, but I think there is something to say about the theater world where I don't think we really need one. Cause in my experience, it's people kind of get changed wherever you want. You know, I've been in so many shows down in my underwear. Um, and you, you, you're, you know, sometimes you're just like, and you don't even have the time to think about it. Um, but maybe that's my privilege. Um, so yeah, I guess that's my thought. All right. Um, I guess we're going to go ahead and end this. Um, guys, if you want more information, be on the lookout for our podcast, maybe. <laughs> um, if you have any other questions, by all means, you can either email us or send us a private message. I mean, everybody knows somebody in, in this forum. <laughs> we will gladly, gladly answer any questions, the four of us. Um, hell, maybe if you guys give us enough questions, we can ha we can have something we can have some content for our podcast. I'm just saying. Hey, yeah. Audible gasp. Audible. <laughs> uh, folks, if you do want to email us, please. It is we, the number three queens productions at gmail .com. Once again, we the number three queens productions at gmail .com. Um, On that note, it's been fun. It's been real. Fun. A pleasure. Fun. <laughs>